Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Shaheen Gadir, and thank you again for joining us on Fertility Talk by Dr. Gadir. I have the pleasure today of speaking with uh, Dr. Russo. I'm actually uh, very excited that we are going to be recording some information that's going to go on his podcast and is also here on my YouTube channel. Um, so thank you very much, and I'm really excited for the next uh, uh, 45 minutes of our discussion. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dr. Ruscio Radio. This is Dr. Ruscio. Today I'm here with Dr. Shaheen Gadir, and we are going to be talking about fertility, something that I feel we have not expounded upon enough on the podcast, but definitely excited to pick his brain and uh, have him here on the show. And uh, I guess, uh, Shaheen, why don't you start off by telling people a little bit about you, your background, how you found your way into, into uh, fertility and all that good stuff. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, um, I'm Shaheen Gadir. I am a fertility specialist at Southern California Reproductive Center. I have been working here for over 16 years as a partner. Um, I did my original training in obstetrics and gynecology, and then moved on to complete a fellowship at both Cedars and UCLA um, in reproductive medicine. Um, and the fellowship is titled Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Um, our clinic is Southern California Reproductive Center. We're noted to be one of the top 10 fertility centers um, in the USA and one of the largest on the West Coast of the United States. Um, and thankfully, one of the highest success rates of pregnancy success uh, in the country. So uh, thank you very much and uh, very glad to be here. So the, the topic of fertility, I'm sure you know, you being integrative in scope may be one that frustrates you at times. Um, I'm assuming, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that there is this maybe over-reliance on uh, hormonal injections and things of this ilk and not the foundational steps of diet, stress, lifestyle, um, especially food quality, sleep, these things would seem to be fairly important for many things, including fertility. Is it fair to say there, there's a bit of a cart before, uh, before the horse with fertility? You know, I got to say, it depends on how you practice medicine. So I'm very careful to make sure to address all of those things. I, I think it's really, really important to look at all of those aspects of someone's life before um, going straight to injections and figuring things out. Uh, for me in particular, um, Maybe I'm a little bit more rare in my breed of uh, fertility specialists, but I like to make sure that people are in great health. I want to make sure that people are looking at what goes into their bodies because that is what's going to be coming out of their bodies. So functional medicine and all of the things that come along with it, even though I'm not a specialist in that area, is something that's really important for me. And I encourage my patients to be at the tip top shape of their health while beginning this process. Gotcha. So uh, definitely have some uh, overlap there. Where where do you start people in this conversation of fertility? You know, as we're wading in, what what do you think are some of the important kind of fundamental pillars for people to be thinking about first? So first of all, I think timing is an incredibly important topic in the world of fertility. Um, waiting too long can be harming yourself, even if you're the healthiest person in the world. So assessing things like do I need to freeze eggs now? Or if I'm in a relationship, do I need to freeze my embryos now for the future is really important. You may be in great health now that you're 30, 31 years old, but when you're 49, 40 years old or 41 years old and about to start, when the reality kicks in, you may not be in the best of health. So doing things earlier is really important. Um, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine has encouraged many people to try to freeze their eggs um, at an earlier age. They also recommend that if you're having trouble getting pregnant, um, if you're under 35 for about a year, then you should see a fertility specialist. If you're over 35 at six months, you should. I think there is absolutely nothing wrong with seeking the advice of a fertility specialist even sooner than they recommend. So those are really important things that happen for us. And then all of the appropriate testing that tells us and gives us feedback of where someone stands is the other side of the coin that's really important as well. Now, what do the data show on age? You know, this is not a body of literature I'm, I'm well versed in, but I have heard, um, I don't know if the cutoff is 35, as you're maybe alluding to, or if it's 40, that uh, complications go up. Um, although I know some people who've had some of the healthiest kids I've seen uh, at 40. Uh, so you know, what, what's kind of the, the, the breakdown with the age associated uh, 
uh, risk with uh, pregnancy? So that's a really good question and the results of what I'm gonna say right now are gonna be shocking. Studies have shown that egg count and quality start to decline as early as 26, 27, or 28 for women, which is shocking. The other statistic that people happen to forget all the time is that at the age of 20, let's say when you're in the best of shape, if a man and woman are put together in a room for a month and they are told to have intercourse every month, I always ask people, what do you think is the chance of being pregnant and I get results of people telling me like 80%, 90%, I've even had 100%. But the reality of it is that the highest conception rate that we can ever have as human beings at our peak fertility is between 20 to 25% a month, which is shocking to people. That number goes down significantly with age. Um, and by the time that you hit about 30, it's already probably down to around like 10% per month, 10 to 15 at the most. And it keeps going down and down. Now, there are people that get pregnant in their 40s and have no problems. And there's people that in their early 30s are already having problems. One of the other things that happens is that the decline in egg quality also begins and becomes rather significant, more or less for many people at around the age of 35 and on. So it's not that people can't get pregnant at 40 or 44 or 45. Um, their bodies can handle pregnancies, but their egg quality comes down. So we've had many women who are like 46, 47 years old and the best health carry pregnancies to term, but unfortunately they were not able to use their own eggs and had to use egg donors, which resolved their issues and they were able to move on, but at times were big problems in terms of their own egg not being able to be used. And perhaps we should define infertility because uh, I could see maybe there's there's a couple looking at your you know twenty five percent procreation rate per month um, you know at, at best and maybe they've been trying for three months and they were getting really kind of worried and concerned although I suppose that wouldn't necessarily be too concerning so you know is there a diagnostic criteria for when one is infertile? There's many different areas that will deem someone infertile. For example, if you're 20 years old or 40 years old, but your tubes are blocked, you're infertile. If you've already had your tubes tied, you're now infertile. And we have that happen all the time when someone may have their tubes tied with their previous partner and then out of nowhere met someone that they want to have more kids with. Um, for men, poor sperm quality can make them infertile um, and make it very, very difficult. And you know, there's that, that goes on and on. If people have ovulation problems like polycystic ovarian syndrome, that makes it very difficult for them to get pregnant. If it's age related and their egg quality goes down, that makes that a problem. If their egg count goes down, we call that diminished ovarian reserve. That causes issues with pregnancy. Um, recurrent pregnancy losses, which don't really have much to do um, with anything in particular, but we, we can't sometimes know and we have to figure out that causes major problems as well. Is there a, a certain, and I know this is a very broad question, but is there a certain time window if, if a couple has been trying for X number of months that they should uh, really consider having some professional insight? The, the standard industry recommendation is if you're over 35 and you hit six months, you should go, be seeing a fertility specialist. If you're under 35 and you hit one year of trying, you should go see someone. Mm -hmm. I have a big problem with that because if you know, for example, you don't have regular periods, I don't see a purpose of waiting one year of trying. You're not gonna be getting pregnant without having regular periods. Right. If right. you know that your tubes are blocked, if you know you've had a history of STDs, if you know there's a sperm problem, waiting that guideline period is completely wasting your time. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you mentioned tube blockages, and this ties into something that we've discussed on the podcast before, which is essentially abdominal and or pelvic adhesions. We've had uh, Larry and, and Belinda Warren from Clear Passage on, who uh, I believe they've published papers showing the ability to um, you know, rectify infertility by uh, this kind of intense abdominal pelvic massage that can break down in adhesions and scar tissues that may be kind of occluding the uh, the tubal uh, lumen. 
Um, so, you know, what should people be thinking about uh, there? How common is it? Are there some signs or symptoms? Uh, as one example, one of the things I try to be attentive to is ovulatory pain that's also in the same region as a potential flag uh, that there may be some type of adhesion or blockage. But um, yeah, curious to learn more about that aspect. So we've had historically patients undergo pelvic massage for breaking up of adhesions and also to open up tubes. I have to tell you, most of the etiology and causes of having the scar tissue or the blockages of the tubes are rather irreversible, meaning that it happened from an STD that caused cellular damage at the level of the fallopian tube and causes a problem to proceed. That, or one other very common thing is endometriosis. I personally don't believe that that aggressive kind of pelvic massage can really correct that. I think that massage in some ways can help other aspects of people's health, but not necessarily to open up things that are blocked. And so there, there's no other maybe surgical procedure or way around this as, as you, you, know, you kind of said this, but just to make sure I don't miss anything there. There um, are, so it depends what exactly is the issue. If it's a simple adhesion that's that maybe snagging a fallopian tube and tying it to or sticking it to something, that could be released and open. But many times it's not so simple and it's usually a complex issue going on all over the pelvis. Um, and it usually affects not only multiple areas of scar tissue and damage, but also damage to the fallopian tubes themselves, which doesn't make them functional, even if we're able to open the end of the fallopian tube. Okay. okay. And is it common for someone to uh, if they're doing a fertility workup, you know, uh, I'm assuming there's uh, maybe ultrasound that's used to, uh, you know, assess the, the viability of the, the tubal lumen. Is that like fairly well integrated in, into the practice model or is this something that people should be? So there is a, there is a S x-ray test called hysterosalpingogram. I'm licensed to do them and we do them right here in the office where we take a dye that's clear. We insert it vaginally with a tiny little catheter into the uterus and then we inject it slowly as it goes up into the uterus and then falls out through the fallopian tubes. We double check to see with an x-ray picture under fluoroscopy, it's like an x-ray video, to see as the dye is going through. This is right then and there, you can tell if there's a problem, if there is an issue, and exactly what is going on and be able to tell that to the patient. Sometimes the pushing of the fluid through is able to unblock some issues of mucus buildup or other things that could have potentially caused an issue, but generally speaking, it cannot cure the problem. And uh, outside of your office, is this something that is routinely done or, or should, be, uh, should patients be asking about this? So many people go to radiologists to do that procedure. We're lucky that we have that procedure here and I can do it and I'm licensed to do it. I think doing it with a fertility specialist is much better than doing it with a radiologist. Gotcha. Okay. Um, coming back for a moment to diet and lifestyle, is there anything there outside of the obvious that you think uh, people should be aware of? I'm so sorry. Can you repeat that one more time? I missed oh, the last couple. Sure, of sure, sure. Out, uh, coming back to diet and lifestyle, outside of you know the obvious things, mitigating stress, sleeping enough, eating a high quality diet, is there anything else that you, you feel people should be aware of in that realm? First of all, those aren't as obvious for many people as we think yeah, they true. are. Yeah, okay. Fair point. <laughs> and um, I've had patients, you know, that were overweight when I was trying to explain that maybe they shouldn't intake as many carbs, you know, said to me, what's a carb? I mean, so I assumed not yeah. <laughs> to assume everyone understands everything that I necessarily am explaining. Um, but I think that nutrition is very, very important. For the purposes of fertility, to be very honest, actually, um, your body mass index, your BMI, which is your weight and height all taken into consideration, is incredibly related to fertility. So the higher your weight, the more overweight you are, the lower the chances of successful implantation and pregnancy become. So I'm, ass I'm assuming there, there's also a sweet spot where if you go too low also it, it becomes Absolutely, a yeah. 100%, and I was just about to go there. Gotcha. There's also women that are very, very underweight and have no body fat on them. And unfortunately, what happens there is that the reduction of fat to the point of being unhealthy 
and having no fat in your body that converts to estrogen makes it very hard for these people to ovulate and also have good implantation. Right. Um, makes sense. Um, dietarily speaking, are there any, um, I mean, you, you alluded to being careful about over indulgence in, in carbs. I'm assuming healthy fats also important. Anything else? I'm a dietary? very firm believer in the Mediterranean diet, which involves a lot of healthy things, um, such as olive oil and fresh vegetables and things in omegas that fats that are, are healthy for you, um, avocados and you know just things that are just overall healthy for you. Unfortunately, sometimes these diets don't allow people to lose weight if they're trying to lose weight, so they have to be very careful. Um, you alluded to a word uh, that's very important. I think sleep has been very underrated for years and years. And I think the importance of good sleep is very important in your cycle and also in your overall health. Now, if a woman is a regular in, in her cycle, one of the things that I've, I've found to be helpful, well, firstly, is this foundation of getting someone on a healthier diet. Perhaps it's a uh, paleo-like diet or Mediterranean, or depending if they're overweight, maybe lower carb, maybe if they're underweight, upping their carbs. Um, that paired with improving their gut health, which seems to have a lot of secondary um, negatives, uh, interfering with sleep quality in, in some people is one example of that. Seems to get one fairly far, at least from what I've seen, not that this is the focus of my practice, but there have been a number of cases wherein by achieving those endpoints combined with using herbs that help to get a woman back to a regular cycle has been quite helpful. Um, with irregular cycles, is there a methodology you're using to try to get someone back on a regular cycle? So I am okay with patients using herbs and natural things and um, herbal regimens to help them ovulate. I, I'm totally fine with it. However, um, I try to see if we can make things work first, maybe without. Um, I, I really want to see if, you know, when too many things are put onto one patient at one time, you sometimes cannot know what the benefit of them were because you don't know which one helped and which one didn't. Amen so to that. <laughs> I like to kind of start things one at a time. Sure. And to be honest, we're not really exactly sure how to assess how some of these herbs affect and what they affect in the body. So other than the fact that we know historically many of these herbs have helped people get pregnant or ovulate, it has to be for a specific reason that we already know and a specific treatment that we know could be treated with that. Because I have too many people that go to alternative sources of treatment for fertility and are taking things without knowing what the cause of it is, or they're doing it at the, an age that's already, they're in a, such a low zone for being pregnant that they're actually wasting their time by taking and wasting like maybe a year to do an herb at the age of 44. Yeah, so I, I, I think there's a time and place fair. for it that I'm very open to. And if they are in good hands, like someone like yourself or the colleagues that we work with um, very locally as well that we trust, I think it's great. I find some people trying to push their herbs onto people and it's a method of income for them. And I, I, I'm very careful about that with my patients. Yeah, I think those are, are great items for people to be cognizant of. And we've discussed on the podcast, this has probably been even a couple of years ago now, a few that people really should be wary of. Uh, one is using something like Vitex or Chase Tree to help with cycling. If you're, or, or first of all, let me frame that as a consumer would see it, to improve your progesterone levels. Um, now for a woman who's perimenopausal or menopausal, that herb really won't have the desired effect because it works through facilitating dopamine action in the brain and dopamine inhibits LH. And there, there's this whole kind of um, cascade in the brain where if you're too stressed, that decreases dopamine. Dopamine uh, is needed to help with LH signaling. So if dopamine goes low, it, it thwarts LH signaling and it causes a problem, uh, obviously with the luteal phase of the cycle. Um, 
but that only is viable if someone's still cycling. So if you're, if you're an older woman, and not, this doesn't so much so directly apply to fertility, but it does apply to the conversation regarding herbs for female hormone balance. If you're not cycling, then Vitex doesn't really seem to have any merit. The same thing also occurs with wild yam extract. That, that is actually not something that contains progesterone, although it's oftentimes marketed as such. It actually has to be bacterial fermented, uh, bacterially fermented to form progesterone. And I think that's been left out of some of the <laughs> Uh, information with some of these companies that are marketing wild yam as something to help bolster progesterone, which it won't unless it's been through a very specific process of bacterial fermentation. So just there, there are two things that could be very misleading to the consumer. So your points are well taken that uh, while the herbs can be helpful, um, they can also be very easily misused uh, the, the wrong way. Well, one more very important point on that is that also, having elevated progesterone levels at the wrong time of the cycle can actually be very detrimental to ovulation and the quality of the egg and not releasing your egg. So the normal 28-day menstrual cycle of a patient starts off with elevations in estrogen and after ovulation, progesterone kicks in. Patients sometimes are taking progesterone supplements and creams in the beginning of the month when they're not supposed to, and that can completely be a disaster in that not letting someone to ovulate healthy. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so just because you can buy a cream over the counter, uh, again, you know, you want to be careful with, with how you're using these things. Um, what about gut health? Is, is that something that you find has a significant tie-in to fertility? So I don't think there's a lot of research that has been done on that. But I think that gut health overall has a lot to do with someone's health. And there's no way if your gut is unhealthy and you are ingesting things that are unhealthy that the rest of your body can be healthy. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, all the nutrients of our body go through our gut. Gotcha. Um, so what else? I mean, th those are some of the most pressing things I wanted to touch on. Um, but I'm sure there, there's a lot in your brain that our audience could benefit from. So what else here deserves some expansion? Male health. I think mm. for men, it's also really important not to ignore in any way the idea that um, you're just perfectly fine and it's always the woman's issue. It's easy enough to get a sperm analysis these days that men should be evaluated and assessed. There are a lot of environmental factors such as excessive heat, um, a jacuzzi, steam rooms, saunas, too much spinning or cycling, excessively tight underwear or clothing that all could be environmentally affecting sperm in a detrimental manner. So I think that men have to be evaluated as equally as women. You pose a question that's a little bit near and dear to my heart as I've been uh, really enjoying doing post-exercise sauna therapy. Um, I know that's, you know, heat obviously is not good for sperm count. Is there a threshold or, or is there a way to get the benefits of sauna without also kind of detracting from sperm health? You know, unfortunately, there is a reason that the male testicles are outside of the body on the scrotum. And it is to keep them cooler than the rest of the body. Anything that increases that testicular temperature is damaging sperm. Mm. Now, I've, I've heard some anecdotes of, of people kind of icing their boys, so to speak. Um, is that something that, uh, and I believe they're doing it's it for- Exactly a, the yeah. same reason. Icing is also not good because that's also not the normal ambient temperature. Mm. So icing the boys is also getting things too cold. Mm. And okay. too cold is also bad. Gotcha. So you want to be wearing semi-loose fitting underwear and, and avoiding you know, ex well, uh, if, high temperature- Well, if you do a analysis and everything is perfect, and you are doing some of those things, your body is probably not as susceptible to the damage. If you have done a sperm analysis and you do have issues and it doesn't look perfect, then I would say that at that point, it's probably best to assess all those things and try to fix them. Now, what else can men be doing for sperm? I believe that zinc helps with sperm uh, motility. Uh, there, there's a number of things that I've just heard these kind of here and there, but what else can men do to help with sperm count there are a lot of amino acids and proteins that are involved with sperm well-being. 
um, and it, they are, there's not a lot of male supplements out there that I trust, but there are a few that we recommend for our patients. Um, with that being said, uh, I think that it's important to kind of look at them very carefully and see which one is appropriate for your body and for the issue that you're having. So there's a few different mechanisms these supplements can support and you want to match the, the person to the supplement based upon that? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else that men should be attentive to? You know, I, I guess um, these days, cannabis use, um, which has become legal, and everyone thinks it's because it's legal, it's fine, needs to be really, really carefully addressed because lots of studies have shown that smoking, excessive alcohol use, and also the use of cannabis have detrimental effects on egg quality and sperm quality. Mm. Now, do you know if that breaks down along the line of THC versus CBD? Because that, that does seem to be one thing, um, no, at least for, for some there, of the there memory. Have not, yeah. We're going to have a lot of data coming out on all of these topics in the future. Unfortunately, right now, we don't. Gotcha. Okay. So um, is there a, again, I, you know, not a lot of data, but is there any kind of threshold that you think is, you know, stay underneath this, like with drinking, we could make a recommendation for avoiding excessive drinking and, and have this, um, you know, moderation. Is there any, I don't think there's, I, I really don't think there's a moderation point with the use of drugs. And I think that during the time that you're trying to conceive, it's pretty clear that being the healthiest you can be is the most important. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, all right, is there anything else here that we should touch on? Uh, you know, I think we've done a great job. It's been very, very informative, and I've loved learning um, things from your perspective as well. I'm happy to answer any other questions you have. Um, I'm good right now. Great. Um, tell people more about your, your clinic, your website, anything else that you want to point people to if they want to try to learn more from you. Absolutely. Um, so Southern California Reproductive Center, um, our website is scrcivf.com. Um, and I, my social media channel that's a great way to learn a lot about fertility is Dr. Shaheen Gadir, which is D-R and then S-H-A-H-I-N, last name G-H-A-D-I-R. On Instagram and Facebook are really great ways to learn a lot about what's going on in the world of fertility. Um, we have webinars going on every single week in my practice um, that are complimentary. And we have lots of specials going on during the summer months for fertility treatments and especially egg freezing. So we are here to help. And if anyone needs anything from us, please let us know. Awesome. Well, I enjoyed picking your brain here and thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I really appreciate it.